Uh, good evening, and thank you, Dr. Vijayalakshmi, for uh, that introduction. So we are in the middle of uh, this serious uh, pandemic, COVID-19. Uh, what started off initially as uh, essentially a respiratory infection causing mortality. Um, as we understand the disease more and more, now we realize it is not a respiratory uh, disease. It's basically a vascular disease. A majority of those uh, varied symptoms of COVID can be explained only when we understand that it's the endothelium which is getting infected, which is getting damaged, and it is getting thrombosed, which is responsible for this uh, myriad of symptoms that we are seeing in uh, COVID-19. And uh, off late, we have been seeing a very, very high incidence of uh, thrombotic events, both venous as well as arterial. And to just to give you a brief uh, uh, introduction about what is happening in the international literature, you can see uh, what has been reported as a cumulative vascular event of nearly 31%, out of which nearly 27 involve the veins and 4% uh, 4, 4 involve the arteries. Arteries, we have seen peripheral arteries, myocardial infarction, stroke, mesenteric involvement, cutaneous ischemic lesions uh, uh, developing due to the involvement of small blood vessels in the skin and uh, COVID toes, uh, the digital ischemia, patient presenting with uh, digital ischemia alone. And in children, it, it has been shown to produce something like a Kawasaki uh, syndrome. And um, see, as we know that the cause of respiratory failure and uh, VT is basically a coagulation disorder and, and generalized endothelial dysfunction and later goes on to develop hypoxemia. And it is said that uh, uh, a gel-like material is uh, released into the lung, so the lung becomes heavy and that's why even ventilation does not uh, really help in these patients. And the pulmonary intravascular coagulation and thromboinflammation, that's another reason why there is a severe hypoxemia. It's not a pulmonary embolism like the classical embolism that we see in a patient with DVT, where you have a large amount of clot in the leg or in the IVC, which embolizes into the uh, main pulmonary artery. This is not that kind of a pulmonary embolism. It is a microvascular thrombosis, inside to thrombosis in the intravascular uh, um, space in the lung. So that is the reason why uh, ventilation as such is not very helpful. And excellent results have been reported with um, th heparin therapy as well as even thrombolytic therapy has been used to improve the condition. Uh, just a brief uh, word about uh, the kind of hyper hypercoagulable state that we see. We have uh, all the, um, the, the coagulation parameters are completely gone haver, and uh, so we can recognize uh, with simple tests like uh, with the D-dimer, which goes very high and, and also elevated fibrinogen levels, which definitely gives us an idea that uh, the coagulation is at fault and this patient is likely to develop uh, clottings in different parts of the body. And this has been proved with uh, autopsy findings in the West where they have shown severe endothelial injury with presence of intracellular virus, which is a very strange thing which we have not seen it in other virus diseases. We have seen intracellular virus inside the endothelium. So when the endothelium ruptures, there is a raw area that is produced which uh, undergoes uh, thrombus, thrombus. So our whole uh, even the treatment um, strategy has changed once we have realized that things are going to be like this. So instead of giving more and more of antiviral treatment, we have to give treatment towards stabilizing and protecting the endothelium, which will produce better results in these patients. So there is disrupted cell membrane and widespread thrombosis of microangiopathy in multiple vascular beds on postmodern specimen. This can explain uh, thrombotic events even in mild infection as well as in those uh, developing after discharge. This is a very important thing that we have uh, now started seeing more and more patients with very mild symptoms. Practically, they had uh, fever for a day or something or even nothing at all, so a little malaise, and they develop after a week or 10 days, develop thrombotic events elsewhere. 
And same way, those who have recovered from a lung infection, gone home or coming back with uh, thrombotic events uh, in different places. So, uh, who are at uh, risk for thrombosis? Diabetic people, uh, hypertensives, those with coronary artery disease, those who are having active cancer, previous vascular disease or intervention, obesity more than 30. So, this is another important thing. We have seen young, uh, young people who are obese are developing uh, thrombosis without any of the other comorbid conditions. And of course, older age. And we can also add uh, renal failure because many of the patients on uh, renal failure on dialysis are really prone to develop uh, this COVID disease. And the biochemical marker we have is a very high D-dimer, an elevated fibrinogen that should alert us that this patient uh, may end up with a thrombotic event. And we have to take appropriate measures. So what are the lessons learned in uh, these things uh, in the treatment of this COVID? In spite of heparin, so initially when uh, they, it was realized that there is thrombosis, heparin prophylaxis was started. So uh, prophylactic dose is uh, much less than a therapeutic dose. So in spite of what was found was in spite of uh, heparin prophylaxis, the incidence of PTE continued to be high in these patients. And uh, middle top, uh, middle top uh, reported that about 20% of the COVID-19 patients who had uh, venous thromboembolism despite routine thromboprophylaxis with a prophylactic dose of a low molecular weight heparin. So that is why administration of therapeutic dose of low molecular weight heparin was advised in all hospitalized COVID patients instead of prophylactic dose to reduce this incidence. And it has been shown that it did reduce the incidence of DVD, even though it does not eliminate completely, but it definitely significantly brought down the incidence of thromboembolic events. Uh, the other important thing about heparin is uh, clinically used as an anticoagulant. It also has anti-inflammatory properties, including binding of inflammatory cytokines, that is, an inhibition of neutrophil chemotaxis, and protection of endothelial cells, and potential possible antiviral effect. So because of that, heparin uh, has been used extensively. Um, in fact, there are, uh, case, uh, there are uh, case reports which have mentioned um, that use of unfractionated heparin in the post-operative period after uh, surgery for these COVID patients has shown less incidence of thrombosis, rethrombosis as compared to use of uh, low molecular weight heparin. So routinely we have started using uh, unfractionated heparin in the initial 48 hours and then switching on to uh, low molecular weight heparin. So heparin should be started very early in treatment in all these patients. And it has also been reported that high incidence of uh, VT uh, thromboembolic events amongst non-ICU and non-critical patients, this is what I have been telling you, that even mild infection patients have come back, have developed or have come back uh, with uh, thromboembolic events. Uh, we recently had a young chap who had extensive DVT with the involvement of the IVC and the pulmonary embolism that we had to thrombolyze it for that. And it is also noticed that arterial thrombosis happens as the first presenting symptom of symptom. That is, patient does not have any respiratory symptom at all. The first symptom is, is the arterial occlusion. We just recently had a similar patient like that who denied any history of fever or respiratory illness. But the presentation was classical of COVID, the kind of thrombus that we had, and he underwent surgery. And when we did an antibody study in him, the antibodies were very high, indicating that he did have exposure to COVID. In our own experience, we have seen now enough number of cases of uh, deep vein thrombosis, arterial thrombosis as the first symptom, and in patients with very minimal or no systemic symptom at all. And thrombotic complications are more common in women, men, uh, women are more protected uh, than men. And the, th the kind of thrombus that we see is whitish and pretty firm, unlike the other uh, normal thrombus that uh, we see. I'll show you a photograph of that. Hence, many times thrombolysis fails, and uh, uh, or we even, even we see rethrombosis due to uh, that intimal damage that has been already there. And what we have suggested that uh, instead of thrombolysis in these patients, it's better to do. See, we reserve thrombolysis if the patient cannot withstand surgery. 
is unfit or has got severe respiratory illness that uh, um, he, he may not uh, withstand uh, a surgical procedure. Otherwise, we would uh, advise a thromboembolectomy in these patients. So what we suggest is doing a thromboembolectomy and using an intraoperative thrombolysis for the distal arterial bed because here the thrombus is widespread. It's not that there is an embolus sitting in the major artery and the distal arteries are completely normal. So distal arteries also show evidence of microvascular thrombosis, which we cannot remove by open surgery. So there we advise that we do a thromboembolectomy uh, and use intraoperative thrombolysis so that the distal arterial tree can be clear. You see this patient, he came, uh, he was admitted uh, in a COVID hospital with severe infection. He was treated and towards the end of uh, a week, he developed a pain in the leg. He was discharged. He was put only on aspirin and he was discharged. And then he continued to have pain. He developed an ischemic ulcer and somebody did an, uh, even an IND in that. Then he came to me. So by which time, uh, the, it was almost a month old. So a month old thrombus will be stuck. And here is a situation of uh, inflammation where the uh, arteries are also inflamed. The thrombus will be adherent. So it will not work. Anyway, since the patient uh, had lung in, uh, disease, we went ahead and did a, tried a thrombolysis. But the thrombolysis did not dissolve even a centimeter of the thrombus. Uh, in fact, what happened was along the catheter of thrombolytic catheter, there was fresh thrombus developing. So we abandoned the thrombolytic procedure. And then we took him. Fortunately, he had, uh, uh, you can see here, you can uh, this is the plantar artery. Fortunately, this plantar artery was patent, so we were able to do a bypass from this point, the tibia peroneal trunk, all the way down to the plantar artery. That's what you're seeing here. This is from the tibia peroneal uh, uh, trunk or the popliteal artery, and then from there to the plantar artery here. So with that, we were able to salvage his leg. He, of course, lost his toes, but at least we were able to save the heel after this. This is the another gentleman that I talked to you about. He, he came from uh, Andhra, actually. He was shifted with acute leg pain and uh, not getting relieved. And history-wise, he said he was absolutely all right. He had no fever, no respiratory symptom. Everything was fine till one day he developed severe leg pain. And uh, by the time he came, it was already five days old. And you can see here, uh, his CT also showed the lungs were normal. It did not show a, any evidence of infection. You can see here the thrombus that is there in the common iliac artery. Uh, it is also there in the lower iota. From this, it has embolized into both the popliteal arteries. Both the popliteal arteries are totally occluded and with some reformation in the tibias. So uh, we went ahead. Uh, he was otherwise a fit man. So we went ahead and did the uh, thromboembolectomy. So uh, with that, we were able to pull out. So like you see here, this is the thrombus that was there in the common iliac. So you see here it is whitish and uh, when you feel the consistency is pretty firm. And we have uh, done a biopsy in this. It shows inflammatory cell infiltration also along with an impacted uh, platelets and other things. See, this is the typical tail clot that is attached to the... This is the typical uh, tail clot. This is, see, if you, when you give a thrombolytic therapy, this tail clot can dissolve, but this one does not dissolve at all. So uh, there is a high incidence of rethrombosis. So you may be forced to use thrombolysis in some, th some of these patients, but you be ready for a failure. And if it happens, then be ready for uh, doing an open surgery in these patients. And so having learned our lesson in this, now, we, what we are suggesting is this, uh, many of these patients, even though uh, they apparently got cured, the fever subsided, the lungs are okay, and they are put on vitamins and other things, they also must be put on a, a thromboprophylactic regimen. So we saw the patients who are at high risk, the patients who are diabetic, hypertensive, previous CAD, previous vascular uh, intervention, um, obesity, older age group, renal failure, active cancer, all these patients must be put on uh, a prophylactic dose of uh, anticoagulation at the time of discharge. So what we prefer is, is either a low molecular weight heparin or 
uh, we can give this uh, newer anticoagulants. It could be a rivaroxaban or it could be a dabigatron. So this should be given for at least uh, 40 to 45 days post discharge. It's very very important. Same way in uh, even an outpatient setting. In outpatient setting, when a patient is treated as an outpatient because he had very mild uh, disease, uh, did not warrant any admission. Even these patients, if they if they have if they fall into this high risk group, they must be given prophylaxis. Those who don't fall into high, the high risk group must be given at least aspirin. Nobody should go without a, a, a either an antiplatelet drug or an anticoagulant. So all patients with COVID positivity must receive either an antiplatelet drug or an anticoagulant depending on the condition. Of course, we need to adjust the dosage according to the liver function, according to the uh, renal function and things like that. But basically, this is the message that everybody should receive some form of antiplatelet drug or anticoagulation to prevent this clotting problem in these patients. Thank you.